I need to temper myself because I know I'm supposed to keep a good film platform for Nick to film this time, but we're on a racetrack and I'm half trying to race you in this. You know what, we got all the shots we need. I mean, if you want to go, just go. And you're gone. We could not keep up with you. Congratulations. Thank you to Atlanta Motorsports Park in Dawsonville, Georgia, for allowing us to use your magnificent facility. It's a wonderful place to come race and hang out. They got go-karts. And thank you so much to Do It With Dan, who put this all together. He's the YouTuber, Do It With Dan. There will be a collaboration with him on his channel, and I'll link to that on social media when it's done. We had a lovely day for this. Again, thank you to Atlanta Motorsports Park. This is, and a friendly staff, I, I couldn't have had an easier film day. This was fantastic. America could have had, we, we could have had our own 2JZ in 1966. This is a 56-year-old car, 56-year-old American car with an overhead camshaft in line six that revs like a vacuum cleaner. No bowling balls in a dryer sound for this Pontiac, just sewing machine sounds. Here's what happened. Here's why this engine exists. John DeLorean went to Europe, and I'm channeling my inner Joey Diaz here. John DeLorean went to Europe and started slinging dick like a doctor. That silverhead gorilla lands in Munich, and they just back up a truck filled with wet monkeys. You know what I'm talking about? Down the line, he goes sticking two fingers in their no-no mouths while driving an E-type, and the cocksucker gets a hard on like a crossing guard and an idea. America. I can't, I can't do, I can't do DS. America should make engines like this. So John DeLorean, that bad brother, <laughs> flies back to Detroit, where his pussy's in the land, Detroit, <laughs> and gets to work. Smoke little thoughts a lot, feel a tip not a goo. And the Pontiac overhead cam was born, and it confused the landscape. People are like, blah, it's not a V8. <laughs> But it's more expensive than a V8! Hey, relax. Th this has an aluminum head. Yeah, but... <laughs> but it has an iron engine block. Don't worry about that. I just may be an old man uh, who's writing letters to the editor, which are reasonable in this year of our Lord, 1966. But in 56 years, what, what I'm saying, the things I'm saying about Martin Luther King, Jackie Robinson, and John F. Kennedy will age horribly. But I'm just saying that an aluminum head won't form a good head gasket seal with an iron block engine because the metals don't want to mate. <laughs> It's like they're running away from each other. So you don't like the Pontiac overhead valve straight six? No, I don't. Oh, if only this had a manual. Because you saw in the beginning of this a 56-year-old ca car with drum brakes out braking my forerunner and out accelerating it. Yeah, it's, I know, my camera car. It's, it's a truck-like SUV, but come on, I have a multi-link rear and a quad cam engine. Disc brakes up front, wider tires, port fuel injection, cross-flow heads, and nope, can't keep up with uh, old Pontiac. Imagine how much quicker the Le Mans would be if it had a manual. Now, yes, manuals were available as three speeds and a four, there was four speeds, but you had to ask for them. Same deal with the tachometer. That's an option. If you don't get it, you get a blank pod with a circle printed on the inside to remind you how poor you are. Further nerfing the engine in 1966, it was originally these had a well, one barrel carburetor. This of course now has a Holley four barrel and a bigger intake. But imagine if this could have been the American 2J. Imagine if they kept developing this. I understand it has problems. I understand, yes, an aluminum head and an iron block. They don't want to go, yeah. And they had some oiling issues. But this was the beginning. If, 
General Motors would have kept at this, what would come next? Maybe instead of a reverse flow head, a cross flow head. Single overhead cam would come dual overhead cam. We, we would either make it all aluminum or iron, and that would be great for a turbo. And then this engine would have primed General Motors to be right on to be ready for the for the oil crisis of the of like 1971 and they wouldn't have to mess around with that chevette thing that could be retuned for different applications but this didn't happen it was a great engine at the wrong time or maybe it was a great engine for the wrong place cuz in australia what happened the ford straight 6 just kept being developed and it turned into the glorious barra but it didn't happen in america Hmm. Well, when it comes to classic cars, the culture is often split in half between people who can display their car without getting defensive about it and others who are wrapped up entirely into preserving history to the exclusion of the history happening around them. GM didn't know what they had here. But anyway, on some cruise nights, you'll have kids in Honda Civics being told to watch their mouths by Gen Xers who never want to fight in their lives. And other times you'll have someone snapping pictures of a Chevy, Barrel, Chevy Bel Air in the wild. And suddenly here comes the couch potato Stallones looking to dole out flabby fistfuls of justice in a Lowe's parking lot. Classic. We've encountered this side of classic car culture before, which is why it's such a relief to be able to say this isn't the case with the Pontiac Le Mans. Excuse me, you gotta say it the American way. Le Mans. Le Mans. A car you really have to try to be cynical about. Because it's a classic car that doesn't sound that way. Certainly doesn't move that way. Which is not to say that a classic car is only valuable in its proximity to the modern designs. But rather that the more you can view a classic car through the mind frame of a person dailing it in that time period, the more like a regular car it'll seem. Wow, this is smooth to drive. Like eerily so. And it's quiet. So John DeLorean gave us the GTO and fathered the later popularity of muscle cars, especially the big block ones. But, but with its belt-driven overhead camshaft, the OHC6, or DeLorean 6 as it was called, was aimed at giving Pontiacs a more European style, since DeLorean had gone to Europe and become obsessed with developing a fuel-efficient high-power engine to bring to the United States. And he had the power to get his ideas through development having gone from chief engineer to general manager by the end of the 1965 model year. Now, the execution was flawed, since DeLorean ended up putting the OHC6 behind a two-speed transmission. Ugh. But the idea of the engine itself remained sound. The design and configuration of the engine had its basis in models such as the 230 cubic inch Chevy L-Head 6, and the Mercedes-Benz overhead cam, although the components were all designed and built in-house. Of course, modifications had to be made for poor durability of the timing chains on overhead cam engines in the 1960s. But since they decided against making this an interference engine, the belt, you know, can snap without destroying the engine. Not that this belt would, since engine designer Malcolm McKellar and Richard Case of the United States Rubber Company worked to build a rubber belt that was reinforced with fiberglass, so that you suddenly went from a belt that needed to be replaced every 25,000 miles to a belt that could last for the duration of the engine's life, which really meant 90 to 100,000 miles. You know, back, back in the 60s, oh, a car gets to 100,000 miles, it's done. But really, that's just the same service interval for timing belts today. The Pontiac Overhead Cam 6 might have been more successful if DeLorean had stuck around. You know, if we, he'd have been there to advocate for this engine. But when he bailed for Chevrolet in 1969, the hype surrounding the engine died, and it was put out to pasture. Brandon, the owner, sort of said it best when he noted that John DeLorean essentially made the first 2JZ. The first American 2JZ. What could have been the American 2JZ? But he was too scared to keep doing it. It was an engine in the search for a company willing to develop it beyond just the standard and sprint versions. 
a company that would put it into a car better capable of maximizing the value of its function. The engine would go on to intermediate-sized Pontiacs, like the Le Mans, which started out as a trim level for the Pontiac Tempest before being spun off into its own line. From 1966 to 1969, the overhead Cam 6 was the standard engine, and that first year also marked an extensive redesign for the Le Mans in the form of the vertical headlights, the classic Coke bottle design, the split grill, and a solid promise that this engine would make 200 horsepower, and as Brandon calls, weed whacker level torque. These cars, this short-lived Pontiac Le Mans with the straight six, live on in reader response criticism. That, this is a movement of literary theory that shifted the burden of meaning from the text or its author back onto the person consuming the work, you, the reader, or in this case, the listener or watcher. In short, reader response criticism is an exploration about how we can analyze more than the art itself. We can also analyze the reader's emotional response. And more than that, their intellectual response is also taken into account in the form of their interpretation of the work of art, which is formed through a person's experiences. The consumption of art can never be anything other than subjective, because there is no objectivity in how a work of art is interpreted. Different things mean different things to different people, and for different reasons. And reader response is a living correspondence between the art and the person consuming it, and meaning is found in that interaction. There are five different kinds of reader response theory, but we're not really going to go into that because it all eventually loops around to the same unavoidable terminus. You can't divorce feelings from text. I'm going to repeat that because it's going to be on the test. The meaning of reader response theory is you can't divorce feelings from text. Just because it means something to you doesn't mean it'll mean the same thing to the person sitting in the row next to you or the person in the back of the class, the front of the class, or the person out in the hall who I don't, I don't know if they have a hall pass or not. And if it does, it won't necessarily mean the same thing. Some people see a gingerbread house with candy pillars and see the dream of their childhood, while other people see a witch's trap. I see a Thomas Kincaid painting hanging in a homophobic's dining room. A Pontiac Le Mans is too far removed from its prime to be met on its best terms in a period where something like this would be practical. And yet, that level of remove adds an emotional charge to it because of the countless years a car like this has to form a connection with the person consuming it, for the person driving it. For Brandon, it all dates back to his childhood as a four-year-old boy helping his grandfather wax his Pontiac Le Mans. As a child, Brandon asks if he could have this car when he turns 16. Now, normally, you'd have a parent or grandparent say, yeah, sure, I'll give it to you when you're old enough, but then go back on their word once they realize that 16 came sooner than they were anticipating. And the last thing they want is a teenager driving their cherished heirloom. But Brandon's grandpa did something really cool, something that almost no one in that situation would ever think to do. Not only did he say yes, he essentially put the car away for 12 years, mostly just doing preventative maintenance, making sure the gas didn't turn into dried up soda and the oil turned into chocolate pudding. And on Brandon's 16th birthday, Grandpa lived up to his word. And Brandon loves this car to the point he has spent 20 grand keeping it running. You see, there's no really, there's no buying replacement parts for the DeLorean 6. This isn't a Summit Racing, fix it in the back of the catalog, go into AutoZone or whatever and get parts for this engine. No, no, no. No, you got to go on forms for the old Pontiac 6. The only time parts come available is when uh, someone blows up their uh, Pontiac 6 and then just replaces their Le Mans with a, just another Chevy 350. Anybody want this engine? And all the stra all the people who love these engines go, yes, me, 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 I need parts. So this engine was completely redone with a Clifford 6 to 8 kit, which is basically intake and a header. It's breathing through a four barrel Holley carb, along with a new brake job, new dual master cylinder rather than the old single. And he's got a Bluetooth radio hidden in the glove box. Brandon loves the novelty of the straight six because he gets one of two reactions, either, oh, whatever, or, whoa, what's that? Why is that in an American car? Especially in a car that has this much flair worthy of a kindergartner's spaceship design. 
And I'll be darned, this thing really works. You know, it's worthy of that racing name. On a track, it really does work. In the old straight six Lamas, on a closed track of the open road, it's, it's easy to drive off the edge of cloud nine and end up somewhere around cloud three or four. But in the grand scheme of things, you're still up there in the clouds with this. Oh, what could have been? What could have been?